Hey everyone, so we thought we would do a late spring tour, but we're just way too busy to do a full spring tour, so we'll have to wait until summer. But I thought I'd do a, uh, an update on kind of the front gardens that we started to put in. Some just like last year, and this one uh, almost two years ago now. And basically, for those of you who are just tuning in now, this all used to be lawn. And we decided that we would uh, take it up and start to create some shapes and you'll start to notice that um, we took up some of the lawn here too and it's a slow slow burn if you will but we're going to start uh, laying down some crusher run and we compacted the soil here and we're actually going to be um, putting in some stone pathways which we think will look really great once it's finished but it's been hard for us to kind of do all of it. You'll see that we got a little bit of a head start here and we've been having help from our friend Steve. And this is one of the, the main thoroughfares or the main pathways that are going to come in. You'll see that when you don't get around to it, you'll start to get these little uh, plants growing up in it. So the idea is that we lay down some type of weed fabric and then we'll get some of this uh, stone sand or like maybe some kind of like crusher run <clears throat> this is crusher run and then we'll get some uh, sand or some kind of like stone dust and then we'll start laying down some of these beautiful stones that are behind here and having just like really nice slabs and I think that will really edge the garden beds a bit better and then also allow me to control some of the weed pressure that comes around the edge so uh but we're really excited for this because we're not really keen on lawn. You could see how high it grows up. This is one of the few pieces of lawn that we actually didn't mow yet. Um, all the rest we actually mowed for the year. So that beautiful bulb show that we had back in May that we showed you from February to May, those are all complete now. And we mowed that. So we'll probably just mow again at the end of September. So we'll just mow the paths and allow the rest of the grass to kind of grow up. But you'll see here, we had quite a bit of rain and some winds and some of our chamomile has like fallen down a bit, but you could just see from last year, none of these herbs were that prolific. We have our bronze fennel right here. Um, we even have our hazelnut, our contorted red filbert that's right here that didn't even have leaves on it because the first two years we had a massive drought and we had the, the spongy moth infestations for two years now. Interestingly enough, this year we had some of the spongy moth come through, but just as the spongy moth was coming through, we had a late freeze and a lot of the trees had already put their leaves out and you could actually see that maple right there is just starting to put some of the red leaves out now. That's its second flush already because that freeze actually froze a lot of the leaves on the trees, including this maple over here. And you could see some of them are half dead and some of them are new and coming in. So they basically went bare. Just have to say with this kind of unpredictable weather, our plants have to go through a lot. So we have some pycnanthemum right here. This is mountain mints. I have different types of mountain mints. I have some Minarda coming through. This is gorgeous. This is our valerian. 
So this is a popular plant for people who have sleepless nights. So between the valerian and the, the chamomile, you have your choice if you want some a good, good night's rest. And it has a beautiful flower and beautiful leaves. So I like to see that coming through. I mean, a lot of this basil, parsley, that type of stuff is, is coming in, some sage. So we'll have a really nice selection of uh, herbs right in front of the house. Then this is a smaller thoroughfare pathway. And then this is our pollinator garden. And my goodness, it's just coming really nicely. There's gonna be probably some plants that I'm gonna have to um, maybe push back or cut back. This is a sanguisorba. I did not plant this here. It probably planted itself here. Um, people call it burnet or salad burnet. And I had planted this back that way. But you know, these things seed and kind of get moved around a lot. But I didn't want something this big next to the little pathway through here. So most of the times I planted something like this phlox right here. And if you saw this earlier in the year, I'll throw up some photos. Wow, it's, it was just, just floriferous. It was just so many flowers kind of lining this path. It looked like snow. And I do have a type of phlox in here that uh, reblooms in the summer months. So we'll probably see some more little phlox uh, that will bloom. And then of course we have some of our native phlox that tends to bloom a little later in the season. Right here, these pink flowers that are up and about right now, these tall ones are a type of verbascum. It's a cultivar called Southern Charm. Behind that, you could see that there used to be some uh, wood peonies right here that had flowered and fell off. And that purple stuff behind here is one of the most prolific blooming plants. It blooms really early in the season. It's called Scabiosa. The bumblebees absolutely adore it. And it blooms almost through October, November. So I made a point to actually get more of those plants in. You'll see some alliums. And these are, uh, I believe, a cultivar called Roseum. So they have this kind of rose color, which I thought was really beautiful. Saponaria, this kind of low growing soap plant that has these uh, pink flowers. This one's fun. I decided to plant a couple of these. These are called hair alliums. So they get this kind of frazzly, you know, green. I don't even know what these are. Would they be considered bracts or leaves? I'm not even sure what that would be considered morphologically in a plant. Here are some of the Viscarias. I think they might have been in the genus Selene. This is catchfly. So I have this one I think is called Petite Henry. This may be Petite Jenny, or it could be the short and sweet one. I'm not quite sure. And then we have more Scabiosa. We have some Helenium in the back, the yellow flowers, which uh, I started to plant some more Helianthus and Helenium and a number of others that are more specialist pollinator plants. So I started to focus more on the pollinator garden as specialist pollinator plants. And I think I started somewhere in the like 100 to 200 range of different types of plants in here. And now we're at like 330. <laughs> Just keep on piling like more and different types of plants in here that I think work really well together. And I know uh, a few of you have asked in the comments if maybe I could come up with a video on kind of my, my design philosophy or how I think about design of a garden. And I'll have to do that. I mean, I have to really put pen to paper because sometimes some of it's so intuitive. It's kind of like when you're making a recipe and you don't, you just kind of know intuitively like how much salt or potatoes or whatever to put into the recipe. Um, and then you have to kind of spend the time to write it down. This one's an interesting plant uh, called Philopendula red umbrellas, I believe. And you could see some of this dieback. And this dieback was from that early freeze. So it just kind of lost its leaves and now it's starting to put out another flush. So if you see kind of brown leaves, chances are it's nothing wrong with the soil or anything. It was just that uh, early or that late freeze in May. Salvia, I think this is called Rose Rhapsody, Rhapsody 
or it could be rose marvel. There's a number of different cultivars. And then this is a, another one that kind of like blooms, not as long as the uh, Scabiosa. And this has spread out really nicely, uh, Onothera. And it just, I notice a lot of like different small pollinators, small flies that really like to get in on these uh, plants, a little less than the bumblebees. The bumblebees are really loving the salvias and also the penstemons, which I'll, I'll, I'll take you around. The geums, these are um, pretty coat peach and I had rose. These are kind of at their tail end here. Potentillas right here that are starting to flower. And then I have a little rose that is coming in. And then you'll see some Achillea. You'll see the pink colors just starting to come in here. So that's just a little bit too early for blooming. This is another salvia. Maybe this was kind of rose. I'll have to get the name for you. It was some type of rose. It was a newer one that I had planted. And then our lilies started to come up. And some of you had mentioned when I started to plant the lilies in containers and a few of you asked whether I had lily leaf beetle attacking lilies and I hadn't noticed it. But I noticed lily leaf beetle on some of the fritillarias that came up this year as the fritillarias were starting to go to seed. This lily leaf beetle, which is an invasive beetle, beautiful beetle, a little red beetle that tends to drop down if you try to grab it. And I noticed it started to attack some of our lilies. I started to get the, the little um, caterpillars off. They kind of cover themselves with their own excrement. It's kind of gross, but they almost look like, it looks like a really diarrhea bird poop or something. Oh, look at the little toad right here. Oh, hello. There he goes. Hi, baby. Anyway, so I, I took them off with my gloves yesterday and hopefully we'll actually start to see some of those lilies come in, but you know, or I'll have to go come and spray and maybe with like some neem. But the other thing I noticed, and I'll um, share some images of this or maybe we could get some shots now. I had planted pink pussy toes. The genus is Antonaria. And I was excited to come see them come up, but you could see this section right here. It's all eaten down. You'll see one culprit. I'll take it off right here so I could show you. This is a Vanessa butterfly. They call them American ladies. And they have all different colorations, but I took a really good shot of this yesterday and I'll show a close up. But there were maybe 10 or 11 that I had counted. There's still a few here. And they really ate that Antonaria all the way down. It's one of their host plants. So that the pussy toes, uh, plants within the Asteraceae family, which is a really wide family. And as pollinator plants, Asteraceae is extremely important. It's one of the, our most important uh, families of plants for specialist pollinators and pollinators in general. 
And then also Vernonia, which we have Vernonia in here, but it's a late blooming plant. So they ate this all down. And I think most folks with a garden would be like, oh no, like a, that's not what I want. But this is exactly what we want. We want some of our native uh, uh, moths and um, butterflies to be able to have their life stage on these plants, whether it means like eating the plant. You know, you're not gonna get moths and butterflies if you don't actually have their host species of plant, right? So we understand that with monarchs, you need milkweeds, which I'll show you the milkweeds over here. Here's some more sea thrift. We have a pink version and a white version and dianthus, which is a nice hardy succulent. Here's one of our penstemons. Getting sidetracked along the way, we're making our way over. <laughs> to the uh, Asclepius or the milkweeds. Here's a pink lavender, which is kind of neat. <clears throat> and we have a lot of Augustaki, which is getting like a nice red leaf here. That doesn't bloom until a little later. The bumblebees love it. So this is our Asclepius. This type of is, is Incarnata. It's um, a swamp milkweed. So this is a great example. We think about the monarchs. You want to attract monarchs, leave your milkweeds around. And uh, you wanna do that with other butterflies, but they might not be as charismatic or as well known as the monarchs. So this is a great example of actually not just having the plant for pollinators to pollinate, but you have the plant for the pollinators and other insects to eat. And so when I saw that, I was actually <laughs> happy because I'm like, okay, I might not be able to see the pink pussy toes flowering this year, but at least I have a whole um, crew of American ladies that are on there. Here's some peonies. So these haven't bloomed yet, and I don't know if their buds are bla gonna blast or whatever, because one bloomed here, you'll see. These look like they're just emerging, and they might've gotten hit in, in that like late freeze, but we'll see. We'll see if they emerge. Now here's my little penstemon section. So I have like maybe five different types of penstemon here. And the bumblebees love crawling down the throat of these flowers and just kind of wiggling their way in, which is just marvelous. One of the other things that's happening is our echinacea is coming out. So you'll see it's just starting to come out. It's kind of early for this because, you know, I think of it more of a fall plant and we're only in June right now. But it really didn't bloom prolifically that first one or two years that I planted it. But when you're planting something like an echinacea as a seed or as a small plug, it, it kind of takes a little while for, it really focuses on like its roots and growing its roots before it flowers a lot. Here's some of that sanguisorba. This is a this is a large plant. So, you know, I might dig some of these out and eventually take them out. Oh, this is interesting. So this is the, the flower of the sanguisorba coming out. It's really pretty. I think it kind of reminds me of like a, a dahlia, which is a type of um, clover. And you'll actually see some clover coming up here. I have the triflorum, the red kind that is coming up here. And then I just noticed this. I think this had to be, I can't tell you what plant this is actually, because I'm just looking at the um, leaves, but look, the tops are all eaten off. So this is either, we have another deer that have, has entered in. So this is either the deer or it could be our chubby, our like groundhog. <laughs> so we'll see, but uh, we might have some flower tops that have been eaten off. This is a type of aquilegia. So you can see it's like a, this beautiful pink rose color. And then this is a geranium. And then this is our uh, one of our bleeding hearts. You can see this kind of small one, the species kind. And then these are hepaticas. Look at that beautiful leaf. So those were blooming really early in the season. Right here. Very pretty. And then here's a, the, that um, dianthus again. Here's some grasses that are growing up in here. I think the, mo the biggest weed pressure is from clovers and dandelions just kind of coming in. 
And then this is bachelor's buttons. I had seated these and they just keep on coming back. It's also called, uh, this is actually called Love in the Mist, sorry. And I just think that these papery flowers and that kind of feathery, wispy leaves are just a beautiful structure. And I kind of sprinkled them throughout and this is kind of more of like pink shades. And then this one is a Salvia Nemorosa Plumosa. It hasn't like fully come out yet, but it gets this real plume, this like real plume of flowers, which is super different. And then here's some of our little violets in here and things like that. There's lots of little things, like so much to look at in this garden. Alliums, Sallium coming up. So I think when I plant so densely with so many plants in the pollinator garden, it just gets to be like, so much to look at. That's why it was like, oh, if we focus on a spring tour, we're just gonna be here for hours. Let's move over to the front garden because you really hadn't seen this until we, we put it in just like last year, late last year. And I'll go through a few of these things. You'll see this is one of our native hydrangeas, Hydrangea quercifolia. And last year, these got like mowed down really low because we had a deer that kind of came in and uh, kind of took it out. So uh, luckily it came back. And then we have our Prunus pumula, variation depressa. So this is a relatively rare plant and it's one of our natives. Um, we decided with this garden, we're gonna make it more into a shrubbery and even the ground covers are gonna be a little bit of a higher ground cover. So some of the ground covers here are our native geraniums, geranium maculatum, but most of these are gonna be kind of shrubs and it'll be a little less detailed than say the pollinator garden. Here, the pollinator garden is gonna have like, like I said, around 330 different types of plants. This garden has more like 60 different types of plants, even though I think it's much larger, but uh, the shrubs are gonna be much larger and we're gonna repeat many of the different types of shrubs types. So this is a great example. This is a type of clethora, I believe, a summer sweet. And we have several different types of clethra alnifolia, but um, it might be like a, a, a different sub, like not subspecies, but a different cultivar of sorts. And then we have uh, our mock sweet orange, and then we have our a viburnum over here. And then we have these ones that are coming up, had already bloomed. They were like early spring ephemerals. And that one is, a, oh, what is it, a shooting star, but it's a white version of the shooting star. So we have a kind of pink version and a white version. One of the trees that I failed to point out in the pollinator garden, but I'm gonna point this one out here, is a very columnar apple. So this is a type of malus and it grows no more than maybe three or four feet wide, and then it'll grow maybe eight to 10 feet high. So, um, and these are perfect for small lawns or small spaces or even like community gardens and like an urban environment, for instance, or if you don't have a lot of space. And in this case, I thought, well, it would be really nice to have another tall tree. We kind of had these two trees here that were already in the landscape and we built the gardens around them. So what we're kind of thinking with this one is that we're, we, those become our canopy trees and then these shrubs become more of a sub canopy. Take a look at this, this is a spongy moth that has gone on to the, this is a late spongy moth right here. So you could see that flew onto here. So we're gonna probably unfortunately crush him. So these are invasive caterpillars and not many of our birds will eat these. So I'm just kind of gonna go with that. <laughs> um, this is not one of our native hydrangeas. This is a pink dynamo, it's a type of mountain hydrangea. So even though I have our hydrangea arborescence here, which is one of our native hydrangeas, which has a little bit more of a lace leaf, a lace, um, lacy type of inflorescence. And then we have the hydrangea quercifolia, which has a bit more of a conical inflorescence. This is a, a one that's called pink dynamo that has like a pink color that is brought in from Asia. So. I would say about two thirds of this garden is uh, native to either New York or to the, to the US, but primarily New York. So here's one of our other native uh, hydrangeas. This is the arborescence and you'll see from just this uh, seed head that it has this more lacy-like structure. 
And then one of the other plants that we planted as a, gosh, as a um, plug is Ceanothus americanus. So this is our native New Jersey tea. And it's really hard to find this one as a established plant. So we uh, found it as plugs and we started to kind of plug that in. We have a lot of trillium in here too. We had recently American Meadows had an overproduction of their trillium and they couldn't actually sell them. So we ended up taking a number of those and planting them in here. So it's kind of past the trillium prime. Usually springtime is the type when the time the trilliums come up. This is another tree that we planted. This is based on one of our native trees. It's uh, our Eastern red bud. So Circus canadensis, but this one is a cultivar called Golden Falls. So I just wanted a kind of pop of color. And this leaf stays the shade throughout the year and it starts to weep down, but it doesn't get higher than eight feet tall. And then, you know, obviously it will start to widen up, but for right now it's kind of still, still relatively small. And then this is our native Aronia. And this will sometimes get attacked and eaten by some of our native caterpillars. So again, I'm totally like fine with that. I'm all, I'm all good. Like part of the reason of planting some of these native plants is to harbor some of those caterpillars because if you have some of those caterpillars, near 96% of our native birds actually feast on caterpillars. Oh, there's an Oriole that just came flying through. <laughs> he comes to the hummingbird feeder over here. So, oh, and this one is an interesting one. Another cultivar based on one of our natives. This is Cornus, which is the type of dogwood, but this version actually is, I've showed you Cornus canadensis, this is one of my favorite native ground covers, but this is a Cornus and the uh, cultivar name is Kesei, and it's actually kind of more of a shrub that is a shrub-like ground cover. So it's, it's a bit taller, and the growth form of this just happens to grow a bit more prostrate to the ground as opposed to up. So I thought that was pretty interesting, and I was like, oh, I'll try it in, in this garden because this is more of a shrubbery. So you see our acer is starting to come back, but again, here we go, another spongy moth. So some of these late ones might actually start to attack, you know, these new leaves that are coming in and I don't want that to happen. So I'm gonna put this guy out of his misery. So this is another uh, Prunus. Uh, this is another Prunus pumula, not variation depressa, though it's, you could see it's kind of growing a little bit more uh, close to the ground. And then we have, I believe this is bayberry. No, sorry, this is Salix gracilis. So this has a, a pink little flower, which is, a, this is a type of willow. And over here we have a type of Calmia latifolia. And I noticed some of your, our Calmias, which are our native mountain laurels, uh, are actually flowering this year, which is really, really cool. Here's another one of those clethras or summer sweets. And this one had, you know, old flowers. So you could see that in the late summer it starts putting out these really wonderful smelling uh, flowers that are white and creamy white. Some of them are a little pink tinged. And the flowers in this garden are, I should say, primarily white and pink, but primarily white. I didn't want to go with a, I wanted to go with a more restricted color palette so it didn't look too confusing. Here's um, a smaller version of our physocarpus. So this is our nine bark. This one hasn't flowered this year. This I believe is called Tiny Wine. And right here on my knee and right next to Sonder is a plant called Xanthoriza simplicissima. And this is a plant that's often overlooked. It's a native plant. And it gets these kind of purplish green flowers and very insignificant. And it kind of just kind of sprawls. It has this more sprawling habitat habit. But I think it nice, it fills in spaces really nicely. Here's a sedge right here that I've planted in. I love some of our native sedges. This was an Ilex glabra and it either looks like it got clobbered by somebody eating it or it had lost its leaves in that freeze. I'm not sure but this is one of our native Ilexes. 
not something that usually somebody eats. So that's why I'm a little bit like confused by that because it's not, it's not a plant that is easy to eat, has a really thick leaf. Uh, this one had already bloomed. This one is a Fothergilla. And it doesn't look really impressive right now, but boy oh boy do these get really beautiful colors. I, I could go on and on. <laughs> There's so much here. But that gives you an idea that, you know, again, you could do quite a bit when you actually take out your lawn. And I think, you know, the more that we look at it, the, the less lawn we want, really. I mean, sometimes lawn is really lovely, but I think gardens are lovelier. <laughs> or if you can make your lawn into a garden by, you know, like I said, folding in some bulbs or some of your native flowers, I think that gives it a little bit more, more interest, not only for yourself, but also for the copious wildlife that may be in your area. And for us, we have definitely recognized this year, we have had way more wildlife interactions than what we've had before. And just seeing some of the birds out here, like I said, the Baltimore Orioles, the bluebirds are out here, so many more robins than typical, or hummingbirds are just like, uh, you know, coming and visiting the flowers, which just weren't here before. So we feel like that is uh, a service not only for ourselves but for the wildlife here and I uh, hope this encourages you to maybe think about planting some gardens and maybe taking up some of your lawn and we promise as we get a little less busy throughout the year we'll do maybe like a summer tour and a fall tour as well. We'll share more of our adventures here at Flock in the upcoming episodes and if you enjoy our videos do consider liking, subscribing, and even tipping. We reinvest 10% of our Google AdSense revenues back into community projects here in the Finger Lakes. So your viewership and support goes a long way. We'll see you in the next video.